Good morning, EBC, and welcome to church on this wonderful Sunday. And what an amazing reminder these Sundays are that our God is a God who continues to work, that our God is a God who continues to sustain us, that our God is a God who continues to shower this earth in His grace and His goodness. Yes, many of us may have come from hard weeks. Yes, many of us may have had difficulties in this week. Many of us may be facing difficulties in the coming week, but Sunday is the day that God has given us to remember that times have always been tough, that times have always been difficult here on earth, but our God has always remained faithful to His promises, will continue to remain faithful faithful to his promises. And so I'm not going to be that guy who asks you to leave all of your pains and all of your struggles at the door, because I don't believe that God asks us to do that. I believe that God calls us to bring those difficulties to him in this time, to leave them at his feet and humbly acknowledge that despite the difficulty, that despite the stress, despite the anxiety, that our God is a God who is working, who is active, and who is worthy of praise even when things are tough. If you've had a great week, if you've had things to celebrate, bring those in with you, lay them at God's feet, and let's thank Him that He has brought us joy and has brought us things to celebrate even in this difficult time. If you are here with us for the first time, I hope that you feel welcome today, um, and I hope that you enjoy your time with us. And and man, we would love to, to get to know you and, and meet you <laughs> in person. So wouldn't you mind if this is your first time reaching out to us, maybe in the comments. You can even email us um, at office at ebcsa.org.za, or you can log on to our website at ebcsa.org.za. You can get our office number, and we would love it if you would give us a call. So so that we could meet you uh, and hear from you and get to know you better. If you would like to offer us a tithe in this time, you can also log on to the website where you will find the bank details there. And church, we just want to thank you so much for your ongoing generosity to God's work through this church. We've been blown away by your generosity. We've been blown away by your guys' commitment to the work that God is doing in us and through us. So thank you for your generosity. We are so grateful and we so appreciate it. If you are in need of prayer, then you are in the right place. Uh, we love to pray for our family. We love to, to pray for those who are in our family. And so if you wouldn't mind logging on to the website once again, where you will find a virtual prayer card, where you can fill out exactly how we can be praying for you in this time. There is nothing that we love more than praying for our family. And we'd love to do that specifically. We'd love to do that into specific situations and circumstances. So please email us or fill out a prayer card so that we can be praying for you. Then we have a couple of announcements. The first one is that Pastor Promise is still collecting clothing and she's in urgent need of, of more and more clothing. You see, there's still lots of need in our community and we as a church in Deuteronomy chapter 15 have been called to give to the needy generously. In fact, goes, uh, in fact God goes as far as to say, surely you shall give, surely you shall give. And so that means that we need to be a people who give generously, who give give readily so that those around us can have their needs met. So we need clothes for Pastor Promise of all ages and all genders, and you're welcome to come and drop them off any weekday between the hours of 9 and 12. Let's be a blessing to our community church. Then um, we are also looking for sewing machines for Tabitha House, uh, where we are offering sewing classes. And so if you have a sewing machine that you are willing to donate, or if you're willing to donate money to buy sewing machines, that would be amazing. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind just calling into the office, if you have any of those things, you can email the office at office at ebcsa.org. .za or you can phone us um, at the office and we will make a plan to take that sewing machine off your hands. Then Grief Share is starting up again, and this is for anyone who has been through a loss or a death in this time, anyone who is grieving or mourning the loss of a loved one. This is a really great opportunity for us to make sense of the feelings that we have in times of grief and loss and also to be supported in those times. So it will be starting on Saturday mornings, uh, beginning on the 14th of August. Uh, it will be at 9 until 11, and it will be taking place in the parent lounge here at EBC. 
um, you can offer a donation of 150 rand for the material um, but if you cannot offer a donation you are still welcome to come and be a part of this really important and really helpful course if you'd like to be involved please would you email uh, jenny at ebcsa.org dot za um, and we also have to inform you that due to COVID regulations there won't be any refreshments offered so make sure that you have eaten before you come <laughs> but we'd love to see you then we'd love to to support you as you work through your grief then we have a really exciting announcement that there will be a bribe for the pulse youth on the 14th of august at 12 o'clock here at our church we are so excited to get our pulse family back together again it has been some time since we've seen each other and so i know everyone's very excited if you know a teenager who has nothing to do on the 14th of august man bring them through we also love it when we have people added to our family and we are so excited about that so mark that date down that's the 14th of august at 12. and then just a final reminder that we are still raising money for our food fund as again deuteronomy uh, 15 surely you shall give there are many in our community who are hungry and who are in need and we need as god's people we need to be images of jesus who who fulfills our every need and so let us give generously into this fund so that we can give generously to those around us. And now I have the wonderful privilege of praying uh, for us as a church and for praying for this service. And so um, would you bow your heads with me and let us just lift this wonderful day up uh, to our amazing God. And so, Lord, we are just so humbled to know that you have brought us through another week, Lord Jesus. We are so grateful that you have given us the breath um, to continue breathing for another week, that you've allowed us new mornings every time we've woken up this week. And every time we wake up in the week is another opportunity to be grateful to you, Lord, for your provision to us, for your goodness to us, and your kindness to us. Every moment that we are alive is an opportunity to remember that our physical life is only a picture of the spiritual life, Jesus, that you want us on the cross and so may every breath that we breathe be a reminder that we are only alive because god has graciously allowed us to be um, and may we respond to that gift of life by living for you god and, and living for your glory and living for those around us lord we know that there are many in need in our community at the moment we know that covid has has made the conditions even harsher for many um, and has made this the future even more uncertain for many and so may we as a church lord jesus be empowered by your holy spirit to generously give to those around us may we as a church lord jesus be a picture of you who fulfills our every need um, who he who was rich became poor um, so that those who were poor could be made rich in christ and may we be a picture of that father god generously giving of ourselves so that those who are in need may have their needs met lord jesus we just want to pray um, for all the churches in Edenvale that we may band together, um, Lord, that we might be a united picture of your body, uh, that we might be a united picture of you, Jesus, um, as, we, as we live out what you've called us to do. Father God, we just want to pray for those who have come down with COVID. We want to pray for a quick and speedy healing, Lord Jesus. We want to pray for your comfort, for the fear and anxiety that accompanies um, catching COVID for the families and for those who have caught it. We want to we want to pray for healing, Lord Jesus. We want to pray, Father God, that those who have caught it will make it through. And we want to pray for comfort, Lord Jesus, for the families who have lost people to COVID. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the king of comfort, that you are the king of peace, and that when we are in anguish, that you are close by, uh, that you are with us. Um, and we know that you are with us because you died on that cross to secure your eternal presence with us. We pray, Lord Jesus, that this meeting will be an encouraging time, Lord God, that this will be an encouraging time that we can worship you, that we can lift up our hands and praise you, that we can bring our week to you and lay it at your feet and say we trust you with what's happened, we trust you with what is still going to happen. You are a good God, Lord, and we are so, so grateful for this opportunity to worship you. 
May the worship encourage our hearts. May the message challenge our hearts and comfort our hearts. And may we leave this day, Lord Jesus, pumped up and motivated to live another week for you and with you. You're a good God and we love you so much. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen. Enjoy the service, church. I love you and I miss you and I cannot wait to see you soon. Cheers. Good morning, church. I hope that everybody is is well and, and keeping warm in their homes. Um, we're looking forward to spending some time worshiping with you this morning. Before we worship, I'd just like to, to read um, from John chapter 14. And from John chapter 14, verse 1, it says this. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I would go prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know, way, uh, know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As we worship this morning, let's be reminded that we serve and we follow Jesus, who is our way, our truth, and our life. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation growing? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The light of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy of praise? He is. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, 
who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, He has made us a kingdom and praise to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Blessing and honor and glory. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of praise? He is.
Father God, we want to thank you that we can say that you are our life. Lord, as, as I read early on, we can hold fast to the fact that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Father God, as we spend some time hearing from your word this morning, I pray that our hearts would be ready to receive what you have for us. Lord, that we would let the seeds that are sown this morning take root and bear fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Hello, precious friends. How wonderful it is to be bringing you a message from God's Word today. And I really love God's Word. I find it such an incredible um, haven to go to. Um, it's just always so encouraging. There's always something that speaks to me. There's always something that fills me with uh, a sense of encouragement um, that spurs me on. And how wonderful to be bringing God's Word to you today because I think we need that, don't we? We need a sense of of encouragement at this time and there may be some of you who are watching this and you're possibly feeling a little bit defeated at the moment we've been through an incredible time it's been the most trying almost two years now and i'm sure many of you like me feel quite exhausted and quite yeah quite tired by what our circumstances have held for us and you know, if I think of our greater church community, I don't think there's a single one of us who hasn't been affected by COVID in some way. And for some of us, that has meant really deep loss. Yeah, and I think f we're reeling. We're reeling from this pandemic and what it's meant for us personally, what it's meant for us as a community. Many of us are still recovering from the physical effects of having COVID. Um, and then not only that, uh, our country was thrown into such turmoil, and I think that's also left us feeling quite disconcerted and feeling a sense of anxiety. And then this ongoing situation of having to be isolated from people is really not easy. Um, we're not connecting with family and friends in the way that we would like to. Um, even colleagues, even strangers, you know, we can't see people's faces. And, and that's hard. And for many of us, we're also feeling lonely. And even for those of us who are celebrating things, things like 
weddings or birthdays or special milestones, we're doing it in a different way because we, we can't do it in the way that we could before. And that's not easy. It's not easy. And although it's right for us to acknowledge that we're living in difficult times and these times are taking a toil on us, my message here today is certainly not to exacerbate any of those feelings that you might have. Uh, no, it's actually quite the opposite. I want to remind you today that we as believers have a different lens in which we can look at the world around us. And that is such an encouraging thing because this lens lifts our eyes above the immediate circumstances and it helps us to see things in a perspective that is greater than possibly what immediately meets the eye. And, you know, I've just been thinking over this on, on the last couple of weeks and I was reminded of a song that we sang in South Africa uh, in many churches across South Africa in the early and, and mid-90s. And let me see if you remember it. And don't worry, I'm not going to sing it for you, but I'm just going to read the words because I think they are so encouraging. And it says, we lift up our eyes above the troubles in our land and together we stand and we declare that you are king. In times like these, we choose to praise you because it's you who really matters. You are worthy of all praise. And then the song goes on and says, and we will say that you are good because the miracles you've done have brought us joy and we are changed and all the hope we have, we place in you right now. And I think that is a song that we really need to be carrying in our hearts at this time. We need to be reminded of the hope that we have and where to find our hope. And, you know, just uh, talking about this concept of, of hope, it's such an important thing. And, you know, I was just chatting to this, um, about this to Errol, and he reminded me of this really powerful movie. Um, it's quite old now, but it's the movie The Enemy at the Gates. And I don't know if you remember it, but it's just this really dramatic story. And it's set in the Second World War, and, you know, um, Germany is just at the height of its power, you know, and so you see the Third Reich is just, you know, um, chomping its way through, through Europe, a and part of its offensive attack is to move eastward into Russia, because it really wants to get a hold of the Russian oil fields, and, and this movie plays itself out in the city of Stalingrad, and it starts off, and it's so unbelievably dramatic, I mean, the Germans are just annihilating the Russians. And I mean, the poor Russians, they're just in a state of chaos. They don't know how to cope with the situation. They don't have enough weapons. You know, the soldiers are just um, not experienced enough to deal with it. And they are being absolutely mowed down. It's devastating. And you see people desperately trying to leave the cities. You see um, soldiers who are just overwhelmed by the situation and just want to flee. And of course, then their officers, you know, are trying to get them to stay committed to the cause. And they start shooting deserters. And it's, it's terrifying. It's actually so unbelievably overwhelming. And uh, the commissar, Nikita Khrushchev, he arrives in Stalingrad. And of course, he is just, you know, furious at the situation. What is wrong with these soldiers? They need to stay committed to the cause. And how are we going to get them um, to, c to commit to this and defend Stalingrad and defend the motherland? And he starts shouting at his, his officers and like, what, what are your plans, you know? And, and officers and generals, they start coming up with, with plans, like, oh, maybe we should, we should shoot, <laughs> you know, the officers who are retreating. And others go, oh, well, maybe those who've defected, maybe we should deport their families. Um, and, you know, there's suggestions of making sort of public examples of those who, who aren't brave enough to face this fight. And then one of the, the officers says, what we need to do is give people hope. We need to give them hope. We need to remind them of why they're here. We need to remind them of what they believe in. We need to give them some kind of pride in their identity, a reason to keep fighting. We need to encourage them with stories of people where hope has prevailed. And yes, let's make examples of people, but let them be examples that can be followed. And it was such a powerful, pivotal moment in the movie 
when they realized to try um, you know, to get people to fight for something when they felt hopeless was a losing battle. But when they could instill people with hope, things changed for the Russians. And you know, it's just a great movie to watch. You can go see how it turns out. But I think this is such an important message for us today. People need hope. You and I need hope. We need to be able to reorientate our thinking and, and be filled again with a sense of courage when we faced with these things that seem to be overwhelming. And uh, let's see how this is expressed in our reading from Acts today, uh, because Paul points us in this direction as well. And we're in Acts uh, chapter 26 in our sermon series, Actions Speak Louder. And yeah, Paul is just becoming more and more aware that his time on earth is short. He knows that the end is near. And in fact, the reality is probably only about two years away from death by execution. Not only is his life nearly over, but he himself has been through unbelievable trial and hardship. And, you know, that trial and hardship is both uh, physical, you know, physical things that he's had to endure, but also outright hostility from people. And, and linked with that is also an internal anxiety that he is experiencing. And let me remind you what he says about this in 2 Corinthians. He says, five times I've received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, Danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all of the churches. Now, Paul is experiencing deep anxiety, deep um, opposition, deep difficulties. And, and here again in Acts chapter 26, we see Paul again in a hostile environment where people are wanting him dead. And so he is brought in before Agrippa II, who is basically the last king of the Herodian line. And he has to give an account to him and to his sister Bernice. Um, as well as Festus, who was the Roman governor at the time. And, and he is in front of them, and he has to defend himself. And what is the first thing that Paul speaks of? He speaks of hope. Hope. Isn't it amazing? And, and the irony is that it is this very hope that he has that has resulted in him, him now being in chains again. And let's see what he says in Acts 26, reading from verse 6. He says, Now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the fulfillment of God's promise made to our ancestors. This is the promise our 12 tribes of Israel are longing to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God night and day. Yet, Your Majesty, the Jews accuse me of having this hope. And, and what is this hope that he's talking about? Well, later um, in his defense, in verse 22, he, he explains it. He says, I teach nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that Jesus must suffer and be the first to rise from the dead, and in this way announce God's light to both Jews and to the Gentiles. See, this hope that Paul speaks of is completely centered around Jesus. And then Paul goes on and he explains exactly how he came to know this hope. Um, and it's a, just this beautiful testimony that I'll read through. And as I read through it, notice how he speaks about um, what his life was like before he had this encounter with Jesus. And then he explains this encounter and yeah, how he came to believe in God and that Jesus is the one who forgives sins. And then he also describes how meeting Jesus has completely reorientated his life, which is quite a beautiful thing to behold. So reading from verse 9, let's see what he says. He said, I used to believe 
that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus of Nazareth. Indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many believers in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many times I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. One day I was on such a mission to Damascus, armed with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shone down on me and those traveling with me. We all fell down and I heard a boy saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now stand up, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me and tell them what I will show you in the future. And I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place amongst God's people who are set apart by faith in me. And so, King Agrippa, I obeyed that vision from heaven. I preached first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all Judea, and also to the Gentiles that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove they have changed by the good things they do. It was for this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. I mean, that is just an amazing story of transformation. And, and notice in it what is the basis of the hope that Paul now speaks about. His hope is founded on an encounter with the risen Jesus Christ. And I'm sure there are many that are listening to this today who understand what Paul is talking about. I had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ uh, for the first time when I was 13 years old. And, you know, we may think that a 13-year-old is possibly too young um, to have any significant or mature thoughts about life. Oh, that's just not true. It's not true at all. Um, I had a very profound encounter with Jesus that completely reorientated my thinking. And, you know, my testimony is not really um, the, the center of this message today, but I just was in a place of absolute hopelessness. And Jesus met me, and I understood who I could be in him. And surrendering my life to him gave me an absolute new sense of purpose and hope. And it completely changed my thinking of everything. Uh, and let me just say, you know, at th that time when I, was, when I was saved, I was in a very difficult situation at home and things were complicated. My, my um, environment didn't change. Things stayed the same. But Jesus changed me so that my orientation towards what I was going through could change profoundly. And it, it has been the most amazing thing. It's really helped me to see my world around me through completely different lenses. And, yeah, that was the first encounter with Jesus. You know, praise him that he doesn't just do one. He does many. There have been many opportunities where, where I've encountered Jesus, whether it be on my own, either praying or reading the word or worshiping or not even, you know, where God just kind of breaks into my thinking um, and speaks to me or, you know, whether we, together with other believers and, and God encounters us. Um, it can be in times of joy or times of sorrow. But every time that I have had a profound encounter with Jesus, I have walked away with a greater depth of this hope that I have in him. Um, it really is renewed and strengthened, and I'm so grateful for that. And my prayer really is, if you've never had that experience, that you seek it out. You ask God to meet you where you're at. I mean, that's what I did as a, a young 13-year-old, and God was really faithful in, in meeting with me at that point. And, you know, Paul speaks more about this hope. It's such a beautiful thing. As I said um, in Acts 23, he speaks about how Jesus had to suffer 
and then was resurrected from the dead in order to be the means to proclaim light to both Jews and Gentiles. So this hope really is founded on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, you know, why does this become our source of hope? It's quite something to think about. And, you know, my encounter with Jesus was incredible on that Friday night um, when I cried out to him. But, you know, the more I think back on it, the more I think the next day was possibly even more incredible because I did something that we kind of laugh at when people do, but I did that once. This one time, I just opened my Bible, and you kind of expect it to open up into the Psalms because it tends to be in the middle. No, I fully believe this was Spirit-directed. My Bible opened up to Romans 5, verse 1 to 2. And let me read to you, because I think in this, God explained to me what had happened to me. And it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And then later in verse 5 says, and this hope does not disappoint us. And I can testify to that. That hope has not disappointed me at all. And, you know, it's not a blind hope. We can look around us in this day and age and we can possibly look to put our hope in a vaccination or we can put our, our hope into, you know, political leaders who can try and bring stability or whatever the case may be. Um, but this is a different kind of hope, right? It's a, it's a hope that's anchored into something that is way more real and way more effective and long-lasting. And that really is the saving work of Jesus Christ, um, and it doesn't disappoint us because it is real, because it surpasses all other things. And, and Paul, when he mentions this hope, he speaks about it being a light both to Jews and to Gentiles. And I just love that metaphor, don't you? I mean, it's something that we can really understand because we understand the opposite. We know what darkness means, and we can feel like we live in dark times. You know, these feel like dark days in some ways. Um, but listen to what, what the disciple John says about Jesus as the light. He says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. What, what incredible, again, just picture of hope that we have, darkness does not snuff out or quench light. It's the opposite. Uh, light shines in the darkness and makes darkness light. We have a real and effective hope. Jesus Christ is real and effective and can bring change as nobody or nothing else can. And, you know, Paul just gives even greater perspective on this hope today. And I want you to be encouraged by what he says he writes a letter to the Ephesian church, and it's just interesting to note that he writes this letter when he's in prison after this trial that we see him standing in in Acts 26. So reading from Ephesians 1 verse 18, the first thing he says when he thinks about this community, and this really is my prayer for you too, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you, he has called you. Now, it's really important for Paul that these believers, this, this um, community of Christians, will know this hope to which they've been called. And listen to how he describes it. He carries on in verse 18. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Now, now that's a wonderful picture. I mean, we face uh, uncertainty and insecurity in this world, right? We don't know if a potential inheritance will be there for us in 10 years' time or 20 years' time or whatever the case may be. But this inheritance that God promises to us is, is a sure thing. It's safe in His care, and there is no changing economy, no thieving mobs, okay, no loss of an employment that can touch that at all. And that her inheritance is a glorious thing. I mean, just listen to how Peter describes it in 1 Peter 1. He says, Or oh, praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again 
Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now we live with great hope and expectation. We have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. This is a wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. We have hope in something that is secure, and it is waiting for, it, for us, and it is a real thing. We've experienced that through what Christ has done to transform us. The second thing that, um, that Paul speaks about that this hope points us to is what he talks about in verse 19 as an incomparable great power for us who believe. And again, you know, I don't know about you, there are many situations that we can face in this world, and particularly in this time, where we feel quite powerless to act. What can we actually do to effect real and meaning, uh, meaningful change? You know, in and of ourselves, what do we actually had to have to offer? But again, Paul just reminds us, we have a hope in that is rooted in a power that is far beyond us. And, and in fact, it can't even find the right um, adjectives to describe it, you know, this immeasurably or incomparably great power. And then he goes on to describe it. And listen to this, because this should really blow us away. It says, that power is the same power as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Now, I don't know if you were blown away. Um, I don't see many people blown away, but we're going to just stop for a moment and let it blow us away. Because think about what that power was to resurrect Jesus Christ. So let's think about that resurrection for a moment. Okay, This is not just resuscitation where you know you shock the heart into beating again. Jesus was dead, dead. He was already wrapped in, you know, funeral cloth. Uh, he'd been dead for two days already. And not only that, not only was there this physical death and, you know, uh, this no life in him at all, but Jesus Christ had taken on the sin of the world. In other words, there was this separation from the Father, the source of life, in a sense. Um, and... I mean, that is just incredible to think of, this situation where it seemed like there was no hope at all. And his, his disciples and followers felt that. They felt devastated at a sense of hopelessness. And yet, what does God do? He, his power comes and resurrects Jesus, brings him back to life. I mean, that's just unbelievable power. Um, <laughs> that that great power, that immeasurable power, as um, Paul speaks about it, it didn't just resurrect Jesus, but Paul reminds us, it's at work in us. That very same power is at work in us, changing us into the image of Christ. I mean, if that doesn't give you hope, I don't know what will. Um, we have God on our side, working in and through us. And just as an encouragement to you today, if God has the power to raise from the dead, to overturn what seemed like an utterly hopeless situation. Surely, he has the power to bring real and lasting hope to you and to your situation as well. But again, you know, just looking at this idea of resurrection, I think it's good for us to understand what does this resurrection mean. Well, the first thing is, it means then we serve a living God. And Paul reminds Timothy of this in his letter to him when he says, we have our hope set on the living God. Um, our God is alive. And that means he does have the power to act. He's not absent from whatever it is we're going through. Um, and if you just think about the history in Scripture, I mean, we serve the same God who is alive, who rescued the Israelites out of Egypt. I mean, think about Hezekiah and his situation, you know, just besieged by the Assyrians, and God delivered them from that. 
I mean, just let's bring it even closer to a story where Jesus interacts with the disciple Nathaniel, and he says, I saw you under the fig tree. In other words, I know what you're going through because we have a living God, a God who can connect with what we are experiencing. I mean, what an incredible thing, how, uh, how inspiring, how encouraging to us. And because God is alive, it means he is in control of all things. He has conquered every other ruler and authority, and everything is under him. Um, in verse 22 and 23 of that Ephesians passage, it says, God placed all things under his feet. That's all things, not just generally, but even the things that you are experiencing, those are under the so in sovereignty of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And our third hope in this resurrected Christ is it means we too and those who are in him will also be resurrected. This world is not all that there is. There is a greater and more glorious future for us as well. And remember what Romans 5 verse 5 says, this hope does not disappoint us. It really fills us wonderfully. And just one final thing that I want to encourage you with today. Not only does Jesus bring us hope, but this hope really should change us. Our lives shouldn't be the same when we have an encounter with Jesus. And, you know, this is certainly true of Paul. Just remember his story. I mean, he went from trying to kill people who were following Jesus to a person who was willing to lose his own life in order that others may follow Jesus. It's a beautiful transformation story. Um, and, and it's good to remember that we haven't just been saved from something, but we've been saved to something as well. And, and Jesus makes this clear to Paul, and I think this message is true for us too. He says, I've appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. And I think Peter puts it also in such a great way, linking it to hope. And he says in 1 Peter 3, But in your hearts acknowledge Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, uh, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And I guess my question to you today is, have you been so changed by Jesus Christ that your hope is noticeable to others? The world really needs hope, and we have the key to that hope. And that hope really should embolden us. Um, I mean, Paul is on, on trial to die, and yet he speaks about this hope that he has in Jesus Christ. And, and I pray for each one of us that that same hope would, would in a sense, burden us that we, we need to tell others about it. So can I ask you to possibly do something? today and maybe think about the reason for your hope it set aside those other things that maybe are concerning you or consuming your thinking and think what is the reason for your hope what is it and and if you're struggling to find hope maybe then go back to the last time you had an encounter with jesus and just remember what happened there and how you felt after being in Christ's presence and, and that sense of hope there. Um, and if you've never experienced that, pray and ask that God would bring you an experience of his life-changing hope. And then don't just think about the reason for your hope. Remind a fellow believer about the hope that we have. Encourage somebody with those words. We all need encouragement, especially in this day and age. We all need it. And then I want you to think about somebody who's not yet a believer, someone who needs hope. And let me tell you, in this day and age, that's not too difficult to think of somebody who needs a sense of hope. And tell them about your hope, what it is and why you have it. And yeah, as, as I close this message, I want to just remind you, if you, you know, descend into feelings of anxiety or being overwhelmed, just remember that this life is not eternity. 
But through Jesus Christ, we have that gateway into eternity, and it is a beautiful and a glorious thing that awaits us. Shall we pray to our Savior together? Jesus, we are just in awe of you that you would do so much, so much in order to share your glorious inheritance with us, your beautiful, eternal future with us. And thank you, Jesus, that we, as we look at your resurrection, we are certain that we too will participate in that resurrection and therefore be with you forever. Jesus, I thank you that even now as we are talking to you, because you are our living God, you hear us, you see us, you see each one of our circumstances and you care so deeply about us. And yet your light, you are the light, it shines into our darkness and our darkness does not overcome it, Lord. You have the power not only to, to give us hope, but also to change us. And, and we put our hope in that, Lord, that we can also become more like you and more effective as salt and light in this world. Lord, won't you bless our people? Won't you keep us in your care? And won't you grant us your peace? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. Turn your eyes to the hills with justice and mercy and grace. There the Son of God gave his life for us and our measureless dead was evil. Jesus, Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. King Jesus, Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our Turn your eyes to the morning and see Christ the lion away. What a glorious storm, fear of death is gone, for we carry his life in us. Jesus, Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes. King will return 
for his own. Every knee will bow, every knee will bow, every tongue will shout. our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Yes, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Thank you, church.